Welcome back for more physiology. Today we're going to talk about gas exchange. So what we're talking about and our objectives. So gas laws permeate any time we talk about gas exchange. So we have to remind ourselves of some of those. First one is what we call Boyle's Law. So this is P1, V1 equals P2, V2. So basically this is actually going to be the ventilation mechanism that we're going to utilize. Another one of those laws is called Henry's Law. This deals with solubility. So this deals with the solubility of a gas is proportionate to the pressure placed upon that gas. The last one which wasn't listed here is called Dalton's Law. And Dalton's Law dealt with partial pressures. So partial pressures is you could take a total amount of gas and you could break it up into its components of gas 1, gas 2, gas 3, so on. Gases are usually not liquid soluble, so they're going to need some type of transportation system. And obviously we're also going to have a surface area problem. Whenever you look at where gas exchange occurs, you're going to see large amounts of surface area. And usually when you have large surf amounts of surface area due to folding or what have you, that's telling you it's an important thing to have. If I look just at oxygen, <clears throat> at body temperature, which is 37 Celsius, about 3% is soluble. So how do we transport that other 97%? That's the job of hemoglobin. So this com complex here is what we call oxyhemoglobin. It turns out to have a competitor in carbon monoxide which is actually is a, rep is a respiratory poison. Carbon dioxide is actually slightly more soluble, so about 10% can dissolve as just CO2 gas inside of water. The other chunks of it, part of it can bind to hemoglobin itself. We call this carbaminohemoglobin. That's about 20%. The other 70% shows up in the form of what we call bicarbonate, and this is formed through the carbonic anhydrase reaction. It doesn't need the enzyme, but it's famous for it. So what is it? It's water and CO2. It's going to react to form carbonic acid, which will fall apart to proton and bicarbonate. And that bicarbonate turns out to be what we hold on to, or the main transportation mechanism source. We are very good at detecting carbon dioxide levels. We're not as good at detecting oxygen levels. Inside of aquatic systems, it turns out diffusion is a problem because there's only so much water or oxygen inside of water. So what we have to do is avoid what we call a diffusion equilibrium. And the mechanism that we're going to use to do this is called countercurrent multiplier. And this is when water is going to flow in the opposite direction as blood. And we actually see this in gill structures, and we're going to see in a few other structures later on, too. This is in part one of the reasons why f some fish need to keep swimming. Not all of them turn out to be this way, because some of them can just force the water to move through. But it looks like this. So as water moves through the mouth and then out through the gills, obviously we're going to have that water with oxygen moving past all the blood vessels and the capillaries within the gills, but what we'll have is in this picture here, so the water is flowing from left to right, what we're going to have is blood flow from the right to the left. And what this actually prevents is an equal and it prevents equilibrium from hitting, so we can actually shove more oxygen into blood than if they're both being parallel, because then they just max out at being the exact same. For us terrestrial animals, we don't need to worry about that. We just need to transport the oxygen to wherever it needs to go. If you try to be an insect, it utilizes what we call a tracheal system. So they don't use lungs, they don't use gills. They actually have a whole bunch of little openings called spiracles, 
that have tissue or pathways that lead directly to the tissues. They also can have things that we call air sacs to help facilitate the movement of that air. It also turns to be highly adaptable, so you can actually have periods of not a lot of activity, then rapid activity. It also correlates heavily with oxygen concentrations. So if you have low oxygen concentrations, you can't be that big. But as oxygen goes up, you can get huge insects. Us terrestrials use lungs, and we'll talk more about that in lab. Birds utilize what we call a positive pressure system. Amphibians also do too. Us mammals, we use a negative pressure system. So when birds breathe, they actually use a two-stage system. Where step number one is they'll inhale, but they're going to bring air into what we call what they call a posterior air sac. They'll then clamp off the air, force the air through the lungs into an anterior air sac, for to then be breathed out. So the result of this is they always get fresh air. It's far more complicated, but it's good if you want to always ensure that you know all gases are being exchanged. Amphibians do this and birds do this. Us mammals, we don't. We use a negative pressure system, which is we use our diaphragms and some muscles in between our ribs called the intercostals. What we do is using Boyle's law, P1V1 equals P2V2, <coughs> is we increase the volume of our chest cavity, which will decrease the pressure in our chest, and this will force air into us. And then what we're hoping is we get a mixture, mixing of the air inside of our lungs, so that when we exhale, we'll force air back out. The problem is this allows for anatomical, as I say, respiratory dead space. So it's possible to have gas just hang out in our lungs and never leave. As noted previously, one of the ways that we need to move around some gases is using hemoglobin. So we can actually track what's going on with oxygen levels just by checking out the hemoglobin. And it turns out hemoglobin being bound to oxygen is pH dependent. And pH can come from protons from CO2. So CO2 and oxygen in hemoglobin are related to each other. If we look at this figure here, what we tend to see without going into all the details is inside of your lungs, the blood going into your lungs have low oxygen and high amounts of CO2. The air in your lungs, once inhaled, is high in oxygen, low in CO2. So what we're going to do is Unfortunately, this one here kind of reaches an equilibrium where we're going to dump in a whole bunch of oxygen into the tissues and we're going to lose some CO2. But here, we don't have that countercurrent multiplier that we can utilize. This, quote, oxygenated blood is going to go to your capillaries, where in your capillaries you're going to have relatively high CO2 and low oxygen. And inside your blood that has a lot of oxygen, not a lot of CO2, they're going to trade spots. These figures here show what we call the Bohr shift, which is looking at pH and oxygen saturation. So this picture here, the way it's red is you find the partial pressure of whatever the tissue is that you're looking at. So like your lungs, it's at 100 millimeters of mercury. So if I were to take that, take it all the way up to this red line, and then take that to the side, you can see it is almost 100% saturated, it being hemoglobin. At your tissues, 
At rest, it's around 40 millimeters of mercury. So we can take that up, and we can say that, oh, that's about 70%. Okay, so that means that we lose about 30% of the oxygen supply that you have, just normal, everyday, just functioning. If you're exercising, you could be down to something like 15% or 15 millimeters of mercury. And that could be, hey, you could lose up to like 80% of that oxygen. Meaning, we actually have like a reserve supply, so if you can go from not exercising to exercising, and you're fine. This curve can be influenced by pH. <clears throat> so as the pH gets lowered, so as we increase the amount of CO2, we will lower the pH. This curve actually shifts to the right, so that if we were to look at this, let's see, well, let me draw it, no it won't, but at 40 millimeters of mercury, it turns out to be a gap in terms of how much hemoglobin can hold on to oxygen. So if you remember before, it was like 70% filled. <clears throat> well, at a lower pH, it could be 60% filled. So at lower pHs, you give up more oxygen. So similarly, if we were to go through and increase the pH, so we have a pH of like 7.6, it shifts to the left, and it's harder to give up CO2, or give up oxygen. So, summary. If it shifts right, this is because the pH is down, CO2 is probably up, and we're going to give up more oxygen. If we're going to shift left, that's because the pH increased, so it's probably less CO2, and it's going to be harder to give up oxygen. There are obviously situations that are going to require some adaptations. So if you turn out to be in either a high altitude area or in an ocean diving situation where pressure is now going to be an issue, we need to have adaptations. This picture here came from an article talking about how high altitude can be involved, HIF dealing with um, lack of oxygen and how under normal conditions we actually have a degradation of this particular factor. Yet when we're hypoxic, meaning you're in a high altitude situation, we actually maintain this protein and the result is you get transcription of genes that actually allow you to survive. So what can some of those things be? We found them people who happen to have too many red blood cells or people who live in the Andes or in Tibet and the result turns out to be they can have more blood vessels. They also have some strange defects that go on in them that to them aren't dangerous but to us they would be. This figure here deals with uh, diving. So if you're going deep into the water looking at metabolic rate and body mass what we tend to see is bigger things in the water actually use up more oxygen than what we would expect and this is due to pressure issues and it being hypoxic why do people care about this type of stuff? Because when it's hypoxic, it leads to ischemia, which leads to all of these disorders. And again, why does anyone care? Well, there's a virus that came around called COVID-19. And it turns out marine mammals have defenses against all those hypoxic, you know, results or schema and 
it actually turns out to be all the things that can fight against us having, like, all the really bad symptoms of COVID-19. So it's a, huh, studying, you know, a narwhal can help us understand how you could fight off uh, the really dangerous symptoms of COVID-19, as you can see in this figure. Regulation of ventilation um, happens through a whole bunch of things. One of them is the medulla. So we, in there we happen to have a respiratory control center, and it's autonomic. We turn out to be passive breathers. We aren't aware that we're breathing, but if you were like a marine mammal, you kind of control when you breathe because you don't want to you know, suddenly start huffing water when you're you know, 200 meters below. We also use chemoreceptors that detect pH inside your carotid bodies and your medulla, and they will force you to breathe. Next time we're going to look at osmoregulation.